Hi. Howdy. Hi. How's it going? Pretty good, thanks. How about you? Oh, I'm all right. My name is Austin. Hi, Austin. I'm Fred. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. And I'm Matt. I'm the one with the website that messaged you. Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for meeting with us. This is yeah, thank such you. a huge deal. I know. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to do like it. Insane. Yeah. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. We got a we got a lot of questions for you today too. Not a lot, but like a pretty decent amount. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So starting off uh, with your recent appearance on Marvel's WandaVision, I was curious if you were a fan of the MCU or other recent superhero films before accepting the role. Um, I've seen some of them. Um, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I know for many, many years. Um, so I've particularly kind of liked, gravitated towards the, the Iron Man titles, although there's relatively few titles that, that, that didn't include Iron Man in recent years. So I've been particularly interested in his. Um, I was a Marvel comics reader as a young guy. I switched from DC to Marvel primarily at about the age of 10, 11, I guess. Um, but I haven't followed too many of the storylines too closely. So there was much to learn uh, in preparation, well, in, in the course of making and preparing for um, WandaVision, of course, which brings in, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't wanna spoil things for people that may not have seen it or have, may not have kept up with the progress of, of the show as it's you know, gone on. But of course it involves quite a few people from the, from the MCU. And uh, interestingly, well, it's interesting, Kevin Feige, who, who uh, is sort of the, uh, you know the the not only the the head of everything Marvel, but kind of the the grand thinker of, of everything Marvel, um, had this interesting idea, which was to make the television shows and the movies uh, kind of continuous with one another. So the same actors, same plot lines, and all that, which had never been done, at least I, not that I'm aware of. So um, he, you know, he's bringing in all not only familiar characters, but story elements from, from everything altogether. But my, so this is my very long-winded answer. I, I, I was not particularly a fan um, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, comic-based movies in general, but um, I did find some of the recent ones, uh, you know, great. And uh, since Robert Downey Jr., I've always been a friend and fan and uh, Chaz, Chadwick, Bozeman was also a friend of mine. I made a picture with him some years ago called Get On Up, the late great Chadwick Boseman. So, and, I, and, I, and that was a, another favorite of mine. Uh, that Black Panther was a particular favorite. I thought that was a brilliantly realized combination of, you know, super fantastic comic book style effects with great story and great acting and, and great direction and all that. So I particularly like that one too. Absolutely. Yeah, very nice. Now, with how big the MCU is and all these big franchise films, and there's so many juggling pieces and, you know, on set, the casting and everything, what is it like? Because you've done a lot of different Woody Allen and Coen Brothers films. What's it like on set on one of those big franchise pictures as opposed to a more smaller, intimate film? Well, that's a good, interesting question. Um, you know, certain things remain the same um, in that you have questions to answer as a, as a character. You know, you're always, you're always um, looking to understand uh, what the human dimensions of the character you're playing are, what the that implicit in the, what I mean by that human is um, there are always contradictions. And I think when you get to the interesting level of acting, you're looking for the things in villains that are heroic and in heroes that are imperfect or at times even villainous. You're always looking for the, the, the things that are not, that don't sort of fit the, the trope, the mold exactly. And you're always trying to find out what motivates people. So those questions are the same, but as an actual physical experience, this was particularly interesting to me because I had just come, I had pri prior to, we, we made, my limited part of WandaVision was done uh, a year ago last September and October, all shot in uh, Atlanta or a suburb of Atlanta, where almost all the Marvel stuff is done. And I had come from, New I live in California, I live in Los Angeles, but I had just finished another movie uh, in New York, which is where I was born and lived most of my life. 
So I made this very, very low budget kind of indie film. I mean, really low budget indie film uh, called Shiva Baby, um, which was written by written and directed by a first time writer, director, young woman, very uh, talented young woman called Emma Seligman. And this was made in that summer, summer and early, late summer, early fall of that year. And this was a very, very low budget film um, where, you know, the biggest line item expense was flying me business class from California to New York and then putting up in a hotel for two weeks was the biggest single expense they had. Um, it had some other, Polly Draper, who's a you know well-known actress with my wife in it, but she's East Coast based, so she was there already. Anyway, and I, I had a great time making that film also, but you know, if you look, the, the, and, and they, I was very well treated, but you know, when, you, when you're working like that on a film with a very limited budget, uh, you have to get as much shooting as you can into each day because you only have the location for a brief period of time. Um, certain actors are only available certain limited days. So there's a lot of pressure um, to complete things. And you're aware of the fact that everything is being done as, as inexpensively as it can be reasonably. You know, when I work on Woody Allen films, um, when you go to the craft service table, um, there's like a thing of saltines and like a half a thing of peanut butter with a knife in it. And that's it. You know, that. Um, when, when I got to Atlanta uh, to work on, uh, to, to work within the MCU, um, the amount of money <laughs> that is spent on everything, um, and it shows, I don't mean that they're wasting money. I mean, you see it up on it's, every frame of the, of the show has it in it, you see it. But I mean, the set, the sets were fantastic. And, you know, of the particular show that I'm mostly in, the particular um, uh, uh, episode that I'm mostly in, was shot in front of a studio audience, as it says actually was. So there was a big bleacher in this, on this enormous stage. And the sets are, you know, beautifully made and all the clothes were fantastic, handmade, you know, uh, Italian, you know, and beautiful shoes, everything, you know, and, and, uh, Jess Hall, the cinematographer, you know, uh, there's all there's things that required uh, process shots. So another thing that that's different is when you work on a movie that's a superhero movie. Even though our thing was based primarily on um, uh, sitcoms that didn't have a lot of high tech um, appurtenances to to go to. Um, there's still a certain amount of stuff that's technologically very advanced that we're shooting at because we're shooting it now. So you may have to act uh, in front of a green screen. You may have to act pretending something is there that you don't really see that's going to be added in later. Um, things like that that are that make superhero movies uh, different than other other genres of movies because so much is added uh, in post production using computers and other things. Um, so that's also a difference. But as an actor, um, you're always um, asking yourself, um, how, what would a person really do in this situation? And why, if the person is making this decision that I don't in, in, initially understand, how can I make that seem real? Like the person actually came to that. One of the things that's so fascinating about acting is, to me anyway, is that it's all about human beings. It's all about people. And people are capable of telling themselves almost anything. You know, black is white. People people justify their actions uh, with incredible alacrity and incredible depth. You know, so so you're always looking to do that. And also, I as a, I have a sort of an overarching goal as an actor, which is that I'm always trying to haunt the audience. That's always my goal. Uh, you know, when you see something really good, any piece of artwork, uh, you know, it could be a movie or a television show or a painting or anything, something about it insinuates itself in your mind somewhere between your consciousness and maybe your unconsciousness and it kind of rattles around in there. And if I see something good or partake of something good or read something good, it sticks in my mind. Something about it sticks in my mind. And that's what that's how I know something is good. I know exactly what you mean, honestly. I really I can't even describe to you how many times I've watched because film is a huge part of my life. Acting is honestly, you know, one of my personal passions. I can't tell you how much watching a great actor has affected me since I was a little kid. 
and still sticks with me from now, even back when like, you know, I was a little kid watching little Disney movies and to this very day, it sticks with you. And I think that was pretty great of you to say, honestly. Well, that's, I mean, everybody comes to it as an audience member initially. When I was a little kid, I owe all my life up to the present, I've always had trouble sleeping. I've never been a good sleeper. I've always had a lot of insomnia and stuff like that. And when I was a young kid, when I couldn't sleep, which was frequently, um, I used to have this sort of game that I played with myself, which was I had a, I had a, a bookshelf full of these kind of like adventure books that I like, like Tarzan and King Arthur and Robin Hood, stuff like that. And I would pretend that I had a show where I would take one of these books out of this, you know, bookcase and sit in my bed and just read it aloud as if, as if I had a show where I was reading it to kids. You know, there was a guy on, this is eons ago, there was a guy on television called Andy Devine on, the, on, on Disney, the very early days of Disney, when Disney was black and white. And he used to have a show like this where he would read these stories and he would read them. And as he would read them, they would then become movies. But he would always start out with him kind of reading the story to you. And then it would transfer over to being an actual movie of whatever the, whatever the book was, whatever the story was. So I would pretend uh, to do the same thing. And, you know, that's, uh, gosh, uh, 55 years ago, more than that. And that's kind of what I do. That is actually wound up being not too different from what I actually do. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it really does. Like you said, even to this day, it still kind of sticks with you. Yeah, there's nothing. I mean, when you, when you, I, I mean, I, I probably don't have to sell people on watching movies or television. They probably do it anyway. But, um, uh, you know, it's uh, when something is really good, a piece of artwork is really good. It does a number of things simultaneously. It entertains you. It takes you away from concerns, mundane concerns or troubling concerns. But at a different level, it also, as Shakespeare said, holds a mirror up to life. It shows you something about reality. It's funny, it, it, it's something that's not real that then shows you something that's true about reality. Um, th in my view, there are three things that make a piece of artwork uh, great. There's a sort of a test. And the first step of the test is that whatever it is must strike you as true. You must see that thing and it must be true. And then the next step in the progress of the test is that it must surprise you. It must be surprising to you. And the third thing is, even though it surprises you, it must have its own internal logic, its own internal correctness. In other words, if it surprises you, but it's just chosen to be weird or to be quirky or to be interesting, so-called, that doesn't work. It has to make sense within its own context. So I can think of many, many examples of this, but they're all so personal to me that they might not mean anything to else to, to, to somebody else. Um, I'll give you an example just for me. This is just in my own life. So you know the movie Godfather 2. I'm sure everybody knows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Godfather, the Godfather movies, I've seen them 90 million times like everybody else has. But still, if I happen to be watching television and one happens to come on television, I'll still watch it. They're so great that I just want to stop whatever I'm doing and just watch it, even though I've seen them, gosh, hundreds, literally hundreds of times. So in Godfather 2, which is uh, admittedly a great movie, there's a moment. This is not a very particularly meaningful moment, except it was to me. So there's a moment where they're in Cuba kind of celebrating the fact, uh, the, the, uh, Michael Corleone uh, is celebrating the fact, along with the some other sort of international criminals, that finally, they have what they've always sought after, well, along with the Meyer Lansky character. I forgot what his name is in, the, in, in Godfather 2, but the character based on Meyer Lansky. Um, that finally they have a, a, a government that is corrupt enough that it will go along with them, will become their partner in this criminal enterprise. And it also happens to be the birthday um, of this Meyer Lansky 
uh, based character. Oh God, what is his name in the, uh, what the hell is it? Hyman something. I can't think of his last name. Uh, anyway, Meyer Lansky or, 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 or maybe, I can't remember. Hyman Roth. <laughs> yes, Hyman Roth. All right. So, so they're celebrating Hyman Roth's birthday outside on the veranda of a hotel or something like that. And they, they wheel in this, this cake, this birthday cake that they've baked for him in the shape of Cuba, in the shape of the island of Cuba. And it says, happy birthday or something like that. And the, the waiter who has wheeled it in is just cutting him a piece of the cake. And he goes, and a Hyman Roth character um, just goes, smaller piece, which is, <laughs> It's so the opposite of what you expect a big criminal to do, you know, to be greedy, to want everything. And he's, he's, he eats this little puny piece of cake, you know, because he's old and he has heart trouble and this and that. So it's just, 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 just such a, I mean, in that moment, I thought, wow, that's so great because it's so true and yet it's completely surprising, um, you know, and yet it makes absolute sense. Um, that movie is about thematically the fact that there are that that uh, people who are guilty of the most sort of horrific things from a social point of view still love their families, and and are very much affected by their families. The same thing is true uh, of the great uh, Boogie Nights, that that Paul Thomas Anderson film, which is about a bunch of people, sort of misfits who wind up in the in the por porno industry. Um, who are kind of searching for a family. And, you know, for one reason or another, their own families haven't been very good to them, haven't worked out. And they find this kind of surrogacy in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this family together. And they, and they love each other. And one of the reasons that film is so great, and, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, one of my favorite directors, um, writer directors, uh, is because, um, you know, again, it's, it, it's this, this paradox of these people living what people view as in this peripheral outlaw branch of society. And yet, you know, they, they love each other and they, they're like a family and they're looking for a family. You know, that's so, and so that's an, 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 another long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> do love that though because boogie nights is one of my top 10 movies and yeah. my favorite thing is like the amber waves character and julia yeah. moore is my favorite actress and she is yeah. like the mom to all of them and it's so endearing and you got roller girl who's like the teenage daughter that doesn't know her place and of course Dirk leaving his house it all meshes so well together it's the perfect like yeah. parallel yeah beautifully written beautifully directed beautifully acted you know, it's, it's, what can we can say? It's great. I, I, it's a, that's another film I've seen ninety zillion times, and uh, you know, never, never fails to, uh, uh, you know, astound me with how good it is. And so many actors in that film uh, who were not big stars at the time, uh, John C. Riley, uh, Phil Hoffman, uh, you know, went on to become quite understandably, you know, fantastic icons and stars. Uh, Phil Hoffman, the late great Phil Hoffman, was my favorite actor of his generation, which is kind of a half a generation below mine. But you know, um, I absolutely love him. I love John C. Riley. Um, I love Julianne Moore. I, I I used to live in Montauk, New York, which is a little uh, sort of hamlet on the very eastern tip of Long Island, and I lived there for years with my wife and kids. And she has a house there, so I used to see her. Uh, with her kids in the playground there in Monta, but I, I don't know her, never never actually uh, uh, worked with her or anything, but she was, for years, she was married to a guy that I went to drama school with, but that was her last, it was a previous marriage and a previous life, so anyway. Yeah. And going off that, now you have a character in the same universe as John C. Riley and Don Cheadle from Boogie Nights, so that's got to be incredible. <laughs> yes, and uh, Don Cheadle is actually a friend of mine. I did a show with him a TV show that was his TV show. I've actually done two, but he had a show on uh, for about five, four or five years uh, on Showtime. Oh, um, House of uh, Lies. House, House yeah, of Lies, yeah. which I was on. Uh, so I got to be uh, friends with him. He's a great, great guy and wonderful actor, as 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 uh, you know, as everybody knows. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, and I'm very pleased to to be back in the the very sizable mar marble MC yeah. fold, you know, again. That's got to be awesome. Yeah, it is. Uh, 
going off of uh, you were saying Paul Thomas Anderson is one of your favorite directors. I was wondering, do you have other particular directors that you would want to work with again as soon as possible or possibly oh, directors you haven't worked with that you'd love There's, to work with? They're a bunch of both. <laughs> they're a bunch of both. Um, I had a very heartbreaking uh, thing recently uh, with David O. Russell uh, because uh, I'm, I'm at high risk for COVID complications because of some pre-existing conditions I have. So I haven't worked much except I have a little home studio that I do like animation stuff out of or voice stuff out of. But since March, since last March, I haven't done any uh, uh, acting of the, of the full body type. Uh, at all. So it's been almost a year for me. It's been a long time. Um, and I recently had to turn down a bunch of things that I really, really wanted to do. Um, one of one, one of them uh, is this uh, fantastic new film called Canterbury Glass that David O. Russell is working on uh, uh, with Christian Bale and a bunch of other fantastic mm -hmm. actors, but I couldn't, I, it's too much of a risk for me to be on a set now. So finally I got my first COVID vaccination about I guess about three weeks ago. And then I'm going to get my second one. And I don't know, we're here in LA, it's a big mess with the vaccinations. I'm not, I'm not sure how it is where you are, you guys are, but it's a big mess here. And so we don't exactly know when everybody's getting vaccinated, but ho I'm hoping yeah. once I have my second vaccination, yeah. which I'm hoping will be in about, I don't know, two weeks or so, then a week or two after that, I'll be able to work again is my, is my hope. But I, I had a heartbreaking bunch of things I had to say no to. So other directors that I love, writer directors or directors. Well, I love the Coens. I've worked with them a bunch of times, but I, I uh, love them. I love them as filmmakers and people. You know, I, I'm lucky to call them my friends, uh, uh, and you know, I think they're terrific. Um, they're. Oh, I don't love every film they make, but I don't love every film that all my favorite directors make. One of the things about making great films is there's always a certain amount of leap in making something great. There's always a certain element of chance taking when to, among the really great, at least in my view. And sometimes, you know, it, sometimes it, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, you know, uh, my very favorite directors, uh, this is true with Martin Scorsese, you know, and I love many of his films, but a couple of his films, I can't, a couple of the Coen brothers films, I really can't look at <laughs> at all. Um, uh, but that's part of being great. You don't bat a thousand, you know, because you take these risks. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, told, never worked with, would luck, try, tried to get in to, uh, on several occasions to various films of his, have not succeeded yet. We'll see, uh, maybe I will someday, I hope so. Um, I love Alexander Payne's work. I think he's terrific. Uh, never have worked with him, would love to work with him. There's a, a, a writer director that I have worked with a bunch of times who I love called Craig Zoller, S. Craig Zoller. Um, who, who you may be familiar with. I don't know. Uh, we've done three, four? No, we've done three pictures together and we're about to, not about to do, but we have a fourth plan for this year. If, uh, you know, the business kind of gets back to where it was. Um, a fascinating new one. He's a really interesting writer director. He's also a super talented guy. He's, he writes novels. He's also a, a, a fantastic musician and writes most of the scores for his own um, movies. He's very, very kind of unique guy, writes very, I don't know how to explain them. They're very, um, often very violent, uh, gritty, interesting, but with deep character understanding. The first picture that I did with him was a film called Bone Tomahawk, which was a Western with a kind of a horror element sort of a horror Western mashup, you might say, but with excellent actors, beautiful script where the characters really, you know, bring it to light. I, I have, you know, I have maybe biased in this because I'm an actor, but I always think that the characters are what makes something really fascinating and that the plot is essentially just kind of a laundry line on which the characters are hung, that you see, you see the things, uh, you see things pull the characters and in the course of seeing them pulled in certain directions, trying to accomplish things and being encountering impasses and difficulties in trying to accomplish those things, th th who they are is revealed to you. But it's the characters that you really remember, you know, that make the great impression. That's the way I feel about it. Um, 
other writer directors or other directors um, I love. Let's see. I wish I was. I wish I was old enough to, to have worked with John Huston. Love John Huston. Um, Treasure Sierra Madre is one of my all-time greatest films, without any question. Love David Lean's work. David Lean, great. Uh, David Lean. My favorite film of all time is a Dickens adaptation called Great Expectations. Hmm. Um, his version of Great Expectations is the best version of anything Dickens ever put on film, and in my view, uh, one of the greatest films ever made. Um, fantastic, fantastic film. Uh, let's see, who else didn't I say? Well, I said Martin Scorsese, of course. Um, I love working with Woody Allen. Uh, he is, <laughs> he, I haven't worked with him in a long time. Um, he doesn't do much in America anymore. He mostly makes films in Europe now, nowadays. Um, uh, let's see, who else do I really admire? There's, there's a long list. Um, I enjoy uh, Jason Reitman's work very much, worked with him on a, a, a series for quite a long time um, called Casual. Let's see. Um, there's lots of them, lots of them out there. Yeah. So we already talked about directors and creators. Are there any actors or actresses that you've been wondering to work with by any chance? That I haven't gotten a chance to work with? Yep. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that I admire and that I enjoy. Um, there's nobody I can think. I, I mean, I, I never got to act with Phil Hoffman, who I love. I wish that I could have, I actually wrote something uh, that I wanted him to uh, be in, but uh, unfortunately he passed away long before it could ever happen. Um, I loved him. Um, I love Judy Davis, although I've been in stuff with her. Um, let's see. Well, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a real lot. Yeah, that was kind um, of a broad question. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I have, I have my own, uh, my own favorites, um, like everybody does, but um, I've worked with some, I've also had the opportunity to work with a lot of fantastic uh, people, you know, uh, Fran McDormand and, uh, oh gosh, so many, you know, terrific yeah. actors. And the, one of the first films I ever worked on um, was with Robert De Niro, uh, a film called The Mission. Uh, so I, I, I had my starstruck moment at a young, youngish age, you know, I'll tell you a story quickly about, um, one of my early starstruck things. The very first movie that I did, um, was a movie called Lovesick, uh, with Dudley Moore. This is, I'm guessing 1983, 80, something like that. I, I got out of drama school in 81. It wasn't long after I got out of drama school. So um, in that movie, I had a very small part. I played a psychiatrist and it was a movie about a psychiatrist and his circle, circle of friends who are mostly psychiatrists. And he falls in love with a woman who's a patient played by Elizabeth McGovern. So uh, during the course of that movie, um, uh, th th there's a Sigmund Freud appears as a character in that movie uh, played by Sir Alec Guinness. And Alec Guinness was one of my big acting uh, idols. So I was thrilled that this very first movie that I was ever in, I got to be in a movie with Alec Guinness. And, I, and one day at the end of working, it was kind of a long day of shooting on a location uh, in New York, um, I, I sort of got my courage up because I wanted to ask him, you know, just about whatever, whatever advice he would have to impart to me. So I said, um, Sir Alec, I, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, uh, but I'm just curious uh, what, what um, what, what, if any, advice do you have to a young uh, guy like myself just kind of getting started in show business? And he thought for a moment and he said, yes, my advice regarding show business is don't get any on you. <laughs> which, which has remained in my mind, his, uh, his opinion of show business. Um, anyway, I, that, I, 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 that always uh, strikes me as uh, I, 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 I think of him fondly. That's incredible. That's amazing. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, for someone who has done so many different, you know, theater work, film, television, voiceover, 
what is it like for you? What is your process? How do you create a character from the page for anything, for any of the theater, film, television, or voiceover? Well, how exactly I create it, I can't reveal to you because I don't know. <laughs> but I can tell you, um, you know, what, 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 the way I think of it, the way I approach it. Um, to me, every character is me, but it's me wearing a coat. And that coat can be a different way of talking entirely than I do can be a different way of acting in the physical world. It can be an entirely different attitude towards anything. It can be a, somebody who is extremely uh, jealous. It can be somebody who is violent, somebody who hates women, somebody who um, takes every opportunity he can to be as selfish as he can to get all he can for himself and screw everybody else. Well, these, none of these things are me. They're this coat that I wear, but I can understand what would bring somebody to be any one of, in any one of those conditions. You know, you have to, when you're approaching a character, you always give your own character as most benefit of the doubt as you can. By that, I mean, you defend your character, you justify your character as people do in real life. You know, even the most uh, vile people, you know, I think when uh, Donald Trump got every, uh, up every day, he didn't say, how can I fuck things up today? I think he general, gen genuinely thought like, well, maybe not entirely, but I think for the, for the most part, thought, well, if only everybody would listen to me, uh, the world would, you know, if I were king, the world would swing. Everybody, if everybody listened to me, everything would be good. Um, I think Hitler thought that. <laughs> I think no matter how evil, uh, people are, uh, by our sort of long lens, uh, you know, standards, uh, in their own mind, they're often doing something that is either necessary, or uh, is for the for the greatest good, ultimately, or for their own good, which is which must be preserved above all else. So when I look at a character, I always try and make the character as smart as I can, give, unless he unless the limitations are very obvious to his intelligence um, and make him as justified in his own mind as I can, because that's the way people actually are. Um, and it makes it real. You don't want to ever uh, look down at a character you play, if you see what I mean by that. So I'm wearing this coat, but the reason it has to be me inside the coat is because I must react truthfully in the moment that I'm there with whoever else I'm acting with and whatever the physical situation is and with whatever I'm being presented with in my mind. So I have to do both things. It's me underneath, but it's not me because this character can be a murderer, could be a milk toast, can be in a wheelchair, could be so selfish that he can't allow his own daughter to succeed in his business as the character that I played was in, um, in a world like Bell's film. Um, he could be so arrogant and convinced that he knows best that he genuinely believes um, that if he took over someone else's entire life, it would be better for the world as the character that I, as Cy Abelman, the character that I played in um, Serious Man does. So Cy Abelman believes in earnest that he would shepherd all of the details of Larry's life better than Larry does. And it would be better for everybody if he just let him do it. Now, part of this coat that I'm wearing is what the, there's a famous theoretician of acting called Michael Chekhov. Michael Je Chekhov had an idea, what he calls the essential gesture, which is a kind of a a uh, metaphoric way of looking at a character where he says, every character has an essential gesture, meaning, for example, Cy Abelman has this style of behaving where he massages people. His voice, his manner, his calming efforts, the whole, everything he does is a massage. It's to put people into this kind of state 
where they don't defend themselves. Um, that's just his way. That's the way he accomplishes things in the world. So his essential gesture, as I'm looking at it as an actor, is that he massages. That's what he does in every situation. He tries to massage. So essential gestures can be anything that works for you uh, as an actor. Um, but so that way of thinking about it helps. And very often, when you're discovering what the subtext is, as you act the scene, the places where the essential gesture doesn't fit easily, where it's, where it's awkward, are places where great light is shed as you, as you pursue it. So you have to do two things as an actor simultaneously. You have to have something prepared in your mind about how you want the character to behave. You have to know what you want to do with the character and know what you want to accomplish in the scene. And at the same time, you must also respond as earnestly, as honestly as you can to whatever you're actually getting from the other people and from the situation. You have to do both things. Now, this is why it's necessary to prepare. You know, it's not a good idea in my experience to, for example, come in kind of knowing your lines and think, well, I'll just be, I'll just wing it. I'll kind of be more spontaneous. Because what winds up happening is so much of your mind, so much of your energy is uh, consumed, struggling for what comes next, that you don't have very much freedom of interpretation. I want to know the lines well enough, if, if at all possible, that I can just reel them off without any meaning so that when the time comes, I have more freedom to respond to the reality of the situation. I'm not just doing my line readings that I've memorized. I have freedom to do it however it feels appropriate given the, 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 the feedback that I'm getting from the, from the reality of that scene. So you have to do both things. You have to prepare something. And at the same time, you have to be open to whatever happens. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the great performances are actually constructed sitting in some shitty hotel room somewhere. You know, you're thinking about it, you know. Uh, it's, it's to, to be good at it takes a, <laughs> takes a lot of work, like anything else. Um, I like to say about acting, um, it's, it's like poker to me. You can learn the rules in an afternoon, but to get good at it takes an entire lifetime. <laughs> at least for me, I'm sure there are some people who are, there are some people who are like poker, who are very good at it very young. But for me, I'm still a student of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm 65 almost. I respect that analogy for sure. Yeah. Um, going off of, uh, going from theater to film, I actually wanted to talk about uh, TV. You have appeared in many acclaimed TV comedies, including some of my favorites, 30 Rock, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and New Girl. Is there any show or experience on a TV comedy that set that stands out to you? Absolutely. And it's a, it's a, it's a one that I'm, <laughs> that makes me sad. My very favorite show of all time was the Larry Sanders show on HBO. Unfortunately, um, that show was gone before I got a chance to be on it. I would have loved to have been on the show. That's my absolute favorite show. Uh, I loved everything about it. Uh, so many of the people on that show also, unfortunately, are now gone. Um, so I regret, that's my biggest regret that I never got to take part in that show, which I absolutely would have loved. Um, in terms of things that I, things I've enjoyed, um, there's a million, uh, you know, for different reasons. And I, I, I don't have one favorite because there's different favorites for different reasons. Um, I loved working uh, on a show called Lady Dynamite, a Netflix show, which is still on the, you could still get it on Netflix. Um, uh, Maria Bamford, who was the lead in that show, she, she and I were the two leads. It's a person I absolutely um, adore. She's a stand-up comedian who 
very unusual uh, in my mind really ranks with the very greatest in the world stand-up comedians uh richard pryor people like that i mean she's fantastic and she's struggled all her life with mental illness um and that's very much a part of what she does but very much part of what she of what she deals with in her comedy but um she has this unbelievable hopefulness uh in spite of all the struggle that she's had this kind of and uh, I loved working on that show and working with her. That was a great um, favorite of mine. Um, I also uh, I also enjoyed, although my part was not didn't go on for very long. I enjoyed very much working on Curb, um, just because all those people are great. Uh, Larry and 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 uh, Jeff Garland and all the and uh, you know I, that that was a really fun experience. I didn't realize I was a fan of that show. Having used to watch it with my wife, you know, just tune it in when it was on on HBO's on HBO. I think it was on Sundays originally, new shows. And when I was cast on it, uh, I didn't audition for it. They just cast me, and having seen me in something, I don't remember what. And I didn't realize that that show is all improvised. It's all improvised. You get a little piece of paper, like a Chinese fortune cookie thing, saying, uh, you know, you are Larry's psychiatrist, and. Uh, uh, Larry's upset because he has a conversation with you, what he thinks is just a uh, casual conversation and you write, send him a bill for it. That's all it says. No lines, no nothing. So then you have to improvise it. And, you know, I'm okay. I'm an, I'm an okay improviser, but I'm not, I did I like, I'm not, a, I didn't go to the Groundlings or Second City like a lot of my friends did. I have no, I mean, I went to Yale Drama School, which was a much more kind of traditional training. I'm, can be fast on my feet, but I'm not, but I'm not always. And I never learned any of the kind of, uh, you know, techniques that they teach you if you go to Groundlings or, or uh, you know, th those kind of things, Second City. Um, so there we were on the set, and the first couple of times we did it, you know, I was like, uh, <laughs> "Well, I, I'm sorry, I sent you that bill." No, I didn't say I'm sorry, but I, I can't remember what I said. And then I, and then I just got this. I remember I got this idea that I was going to be a psychiatrist who name dropped. I actually had a psychiatrist who was a shameless name dropper of of famous people. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to make him a name dropper, but he's going to have like shitty middle of the road names. He's not going to, he's not going to match. the names are going to be, you know, like they, they won't be all the biggest names. They'll be like, you know, they'll be. <laughs> so I thought, I thought of who, who's the guitarist from, who's the guitarist from Three Dog Night or Grand Funk Real that I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 can't, it was, I, I, it stuck, I, I, I had it in my mind who the guitarist was from having a Grand Funk Railroad record when I was young. And, uh, I, I, I remember, what is it? What is his name? Is it Grand Funk or Three Dog Night? Grand Funk. Oh, what is his name? The guitarist. I can't think of it. Well, I remember my friend saying to me back in college, he's so great, this guitarist, because he only plays the important notes. <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Anyway, I mentioned this guitarist. And then I said, I, I just had this idea that I would say his name, blurt it out and then say, well, well it doesn't matter because you could have just looked on the CD anyway and it would have told you his name. So then I, you know, that was this idea that I had. And then when we did the next episode, um, I thought it should be somebody really famous this time. But I won't say his name. I'll say, oh, well, he, uh, I'm not going to tell you who he is, but he did direct Star Wars. <laughs> so, so Larry said, well, of course, you know, I, I, I know who directed Star Wars. And I said to him something like, well, you know, not everybody's in show business, Larry. So uh, anyway, but, the, you know, it took me a while to warm up to actually get something funny out. But when I finally did get something funny out, it was funny enough that Larry actually started laughing in the scene and said, you know, like, go on, go on. So I felt some victory at that. I also, I didn't know when I first started working with Woody that um, it, it's, it's folly to try and make Woody Allen laugh. He's so serious, but I didn't know this. So I said a couple of things that I thought were funny and he actually did laugh at one or two things I said. So 
to people like, you know, like we're, you know, slapping me on the back that I actually made him laugh. Very serious when working, you know, very serious. Anyway. It's pretty awesome, honestly. You got, you made Larry David laugh and Woody Allen laugh. Well, I think uh, my, my humor may have the same uh, smell of desperation that theirs does. It's familiar to them. <laughs> now, so since you've done, looking through your filmography, I've noticed that you did a lot of voiceover work. What is that kind of like? Is that a little bit more different for you, you know, obviously than working on a set, but in terms of how you approach the character, you know, even if you're doing just a, you know, little voiceover work. How is that like for you to approach a character in that? Well, um, in a sense, for me, I find it harder to keep it real. Um, you know, if you're working in the voiceover milieu, you have to put everything into your voice. You don't have anything but your voice. Um, and one of the things that's great about it, that's freeing about it is you can be anything. You know, in if I'm cast in a film, uh, you know, I'm unlikely <laughs> to be a romantic hero or something like that. Um, whereas in the voice world, I might play that or I might play somebody, you know, a villainous character. I can play a lot of different things. Um, but you're much less restricted uh, based on your voice. And you must put everything into what into that that is the character into that voice. Um, you're still trying to be real and you're still trying to react in the moment as, as real, as really, as truthfully as you can. Um, but it's much more limited and it's much easier from a sort of a uh, practical point of view. You know, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to arrive early. You don't have a wardrobe, you don't have makeup. It doesn't matter what you look like particularly. Um, so that make, makes it easier. It's much, and I did a lot of it for years. Um, that was all I did for like 20 years uh, and it's, for me, in those days, it was very easy money relative to other things. When I did voiceovers, when I was a big guy in the voiceover world, it was a much smaller uh, sort of coterie of people that did you know, 90% of the work than it is now. And it was also all union. Nowadays, it's become much, much, much more spread out, much more diluted. Um, and uh, also, uh, it's largely non-union now, which is unfortunate. Although it's let, it's it's allowed many people to get into it, and I think they appreciate the fact that they've gotten into it because they're non-union. Um, it's made uh, the general standard of pay and of other considerations much lower. Um, there are no residuals for people that do non-union work, or not much residual uh, rates are lower, and and the fact that there's so, such broad competition now. The, the, the technology has changed, you know. Now uh, the technology is inexpensive and ubiquitous. You can do a home studio from anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, and uh, you can compete. Um, so that has brought millions of people into it. Well, not millions, but certainly hundreds of thousands. Um, but the downside is that the, uh, the rewards have become much, much more limited uh, than they were. Um, as an art form, it's an interesting art form, but it, it is very limited. It is very, very limited. I, I, I find um, acting with my whole self much more deeply fulfilling uh, because my whole body and my whole intention is in it. One of the things that's so great about acting to me is, I think one of the reasons that I love it is um, it's so consuming that I can't think about anything else when I'm doing it and when I'm preparing to do it. It has that in common with, uh, with gambling. <laughs> <laughs> which I mentioned. Um, I can't, th you know, I, I, I'm not a compulsive gambler, but I understand how people are because when you're doing it, your mind really becomes entirely focused on it and nothing else. And same thing is true with acting for me. So I enjoy that level of immersion in something. And you work with other people and it's kind of strange, you know, you, 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 you have, you know, you might work on a film for a month or two months or sometimes a week, depending on maybe you have a smaller part or a couple of days. So you're th because of the nature of filmmaking, it's because it's intense work and you spend long hours together, you develop these friendships. You know, you talk about things, you talk about life, you talk about directors that you work with, you talk about 
It's just natural because you spend hours and hours and hours together. And then some of those friendships last and some of them don't. Some of them, you know, are based more on uh, uh, the, uh, the reality of that particular situation, but some last. Uh, and, but I, I, one of the things that I find great about filmmaking is that you are thrown together with different people. Um, I think in my own personal life, I tend to be a little solitary. And I also write, and writing is so, so solitary. You know, you, you, uh, I, 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 I'll sit at the computer for five or six hours, you know, and you don't see anybody. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that gets tiresome after a while. So I like the fact in movies that it's very much a uh, collaborative, uh, movies and television is a collaborative effort. Um, I enjoy that. Uh, you know, you, it, when, you, when you have a lot of friends who are actors and filmmakers, <laughs> you're gonna get a lot of um, uh, friends who are concerned with their own thoughts, their own lives, their own careers. That's part of, you know, being an actor. So you have to sort of expect that. Um, that's why I also have some friends who are other things. I have friends that are psychologists and I have a friend that owns a, a big beer company and I have a friend that, you know, I've, I like to have friends that do other things outside show business. Um, often guys I went to college with, you know, that I'm still good friends with. Um, but uh, this is such a long answer. I don't remember the original question. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> anyway, and uh, I'll t you, let me tell you my, let me tell you, we have to, oh no, we're, we have a time. I want to tell you my favorite story about directing, my very favorite story. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. So this, this story was, I heard from James Gray, the director. I don't know if you know James Gray. Um, is, very interesting director. Is that the, uh, did he make Ad Astra? And Yes. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. Oh my God. I love Ad Astra, Lost City of Z. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Gray. my God. I love those movies. So this is James Gray's story. Yeah. True. Um, when uh, Francis Coppola was making Godfather, the original Godfather movie, he cast a guy called Lenny Montana in the role of Luca Brazzi. Now, Luca Brazzi, you may remember from the movie, is that really big guy, uh, kind of scary guy who is kind of like a button man. He, he kills people and stuff. But uh, he, he cast this guy, Lenny Montana, who was not a professional actor. He had been a well-known wrestler, professional wrestler. But he was, and he was very intimidating looking, very large, but also he had this particular ability, which was he could make his eyes kind of pop, bulge out, pop out. And if you remember in that movie, there's a scene in which he is garroted. He goes, he pretends that he's a, sort of a turncoat on the, on the Corleone family. And he goes to another family and they, they goes to a bar and they stick a knife through his hand so he can't move and they put a garrote around his neck and choke him to death. So he could do that particularly convincingly because he could make his eyes bulge out. So France, and Francis liked him, and so he hired him. But he was very nervous, um, Lenny Montana, acting, very. And the very first day of shooting was the opening of the movie, The Wedding of Connie in, that, uh, in The Godfather, which was an enormous scene with 200 extras and musicians and all that stuff. And as you remember, um, various people have meetings with Marlon Brando, with Don Corleone to kind of ask him for favors on the daughter, day of his daughter's wedding, the sort of tradition that he has to grant favors on his daughter's wedding day. So uh, there was a scene written for Lenny Montana, for Luca Brazzi to come in and say, I want to thank you God for the, for the honor of inviting me to your daughter's wedding on this most fateful day or something like that. I don't know what the lines were, but something like that. So he was supposed to do this line. And Marlon Brando was being Marlon Brando and he was not very helpful. He was kind of being an asshole and he was making fun of him and making jokes and stuff. And you know, when you have 200 extras waiting, it's very expensive. And, and, and Lenny Montana was getting upset because he, he kept blowing this line. He couldn't get through the line. And Marlon Brando like put a sign on his head that said, fuck you. And like, it was not helping at all. And they kept doing it. They did like 50 takes and he couldn't do it. He kept saying, I, I want to thank you God for the, for the great honor of inviting me to your daughter's wedding on the day of your daughter's wedding. <laughs> he couldn't get it right. So finally Francis said, that's okay, we got it. 
So Robert Evans, the producer, said, what do you mean you got it? He never said it. And Francis Coppola said, no, no, we got it. We got it. It's fine. Robert Evans says, he never said it. How can you can't let him? You can't you finish this scene. You got to do the scene. He said, it's fine. So in the next uh, few minutes when they were done, before the next setup, which was a big crowd scene, he put Lenny Montana at a table and filmed him practicing this speech, going, I want to thank you, Godfather, for the honor of inviting me to your daughter's wedding. And he had some kids run through it, and you see him practicing. He then cut that in the movie so that you see him practicing this speech before he gets nervous and blows the line in front of Marlon Brando. So it makes perfect sense when you see it that he blows the line because he's so nervous, he's been practicing. He realized that on the fly and made that happen the day of shooting. That's just to show what the nature of filmmaking is like. It's always about wild horses getting away from you. And it's always a series of problems to be solved. And I love that story because it just shows how he turned something that was a problem into a great illustrative moment for the character. I love that. That's, I actually did not know that backstory. Yeah, That's I incredible. didn't know that either. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, Go, going off of uh, the voice acting, I was actually shocked to realize that you're in the GTA universe as Chris Formage. Yes. Uh, were you a fan of the series before your first appearance in San Andreas, or have you become a fan since voicing the character? I have become a fan since voicing the character. I was not very up on the world of video games in general at that time. Um, I had I didn't have any console. You know, I have a computer. So I like some early computer games. I liked the early uh, iterations of Call of Duty before they got so fast that I can't possibly keep up when they were sort of World War II based was, you know, like, like when I liked them and some other games. And I, I like some very old computer games, like really old stuff. Um, but I never had an Xbox or, a, a, you know, a, a, a PlayStation or any of that stuff. But I have a son <laughs> who's 18 now who did have all those things, you know, starting with a, not a Game Boy, but he had a, th a 3D, F, F, what is it called? Three, I can't think of it. One oh, of those the PS. Yeah. yeah, and then he had a Wii, and now, and, 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 it's, and now he's had like everything that exists. He says, you know, he's, and, and, and we still play regularly. We, we play together. And it's been great. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. You know, we've played all the great, well, my, you know, we've played every, um, all the, uh, GTA games. We've played um, uh, all all the Rockstar titles, basically that are great, and plus, plus a lot of others. Um, so I've I've become much more of a fan of uh, the form uh, through him, and have learned about it. Um, but at the time I did it, it was something entirely foreign to me. I just auditioned for it, and I got it, and that was it. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been a rockstar fan since i was a little kid like well max Payne is now a rockstar max Payne's my favorite video game and i was raised on gta that was like a bonding thing for me and my dad so realizing that you were in gta 5 and san andreas blew my mind well you know i it was fascinating making it i was in, we i did it in new york and this was in the very very early days of motion capture when motion capture was still very primitive uh, you know, now so many titles are done that way. But when I did it, uh, you had to wear this, um, like a halter kind of thing on your face, not a halter, I don't know, like a mask almost kind of thing. So it was quite cumbersome. And it was, you know, it felt, it was hard to act uh, normally, because it was big and heavy. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I did did the best I could. But Rockstar, even in those days, was already like, it wasn't like doing a video game. It was like being in a movie. You know, I went to their, they have a studio in New York, which was a vast studio and very technically, uh, you know, sophisticated. And this is, I can't remember what year it was, but it was a long time ago, you know, when, 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 when the GTA series was just, you know, nascent. Um, so uh, I, I, it was very impressive. And you had to sign uh, a stack of, you know, non-disclosure things like uh, like a phone booth like a phone book you know really super thick which for a video game was at that for my 
from my experience was you know unheard of so it was very clear that that rockstar was into what was in kind of a, you know a whole other category and of course you know when when gta came out or, or when um five came out it was and i think probably up until red dead 2 i think was the biggest fastest selling game of all time it may still be i don't remember i forget what the what but I, I, I liked, I, I, we played both Red Dead titles, you know, with my son and, and love them, great, you know. And I have so many friends in the voice acting world and they used, they, in the process of making those Rockstar games, they used thousands of people, many actors that don't ordinarily do voice stuff. So uh, there, there's always people I know in every, every one of their games. Uh, I can't wait for their, whatever they're gonna do next. I discovered another, I didn't discover, but I found out about, um, some other games that are great also recently just because of since covid my son who's 18 he was he graduated from high school last year but he didn't want to go to college if he was going to be sitting in his room on his computer you know that way so he elected to take a bye year so he's just hanging out at home with us helping with his other brother who we, we have another son who has fairly severe autism so he kind of helps a lot with Alec with his with his brother and he's waiting um, to go to school in the fall. So we've had a lot of time to hang out together and play video games, which has been great. Um, and, uh, you know, he's turned me on to a lot of interesting titles and stuff. Awesome. Now, you have had a massive, expansive career filled with a lot of phenomenal projects, but there's one character that really did seem to stick with a lot of people and has gained so much popularity, especially in these last few years. And I would say that that character would be Cy Abelman. Yes. Now, yes. Yeah. So you, are you aware of just how much that that character has taken off in popularity and how people have really just connected with that character in the last few years, especially, I mean, a serious man was nominated for a lot of Oscars when it first came out. And, you know, obviously everybody really loves it. I think it's, Probably one of the Coen brothers' best. It's one of my favorites, personally, that they've done. But the last few years, people have really, really connected with your character, Cy Abelman. Have you? Do you think that? that I, kind of I'm change? interested to hear you say that. Do you think that you think they've connected with that character in particular more in recent years rather than when it first came out? Um, I would definitely say when it that first came out too. But I think social reason, media less, yeah, and social media in the last year or two that film has taken off a little bit more again and your character is really connected. Your performance, your character has connected with a lot of people out there. People, I mean, I can't go on Twitter, you know, every few days and I'll see your character, Cy Abelman pop up. Somebody will You know, it's funny. Me. I don't do Twitter at all. I have an account, but I've never used it. Yeah. But people always send me stuff. Like uh, people make memes and stuff, which always yeah. I'm always amused to see, but I don't, I know about them like late because I don't do Twitter. Yeah, but yeah, I, it's it, it, that's been interesting to me too. But I'm interested to hear you say that he's kind of taken on a life of his own. Yeah. Um. I, you know, I that I love that movie and I love that character and I love and the Coens are you know a big deal to me both because that role kind of put me on the map for a lot of people. You know, that made a lot of people know me. I was was shortlisted for an Oscar for it and I won an Independent Spirit Award for it. It's a big deal, definitely. Um. But it's it's also kind of like my Mr. Spock character in that. You know, I think a lot of people think of me that way and don't realize that I've done a million other things and have other, you know, but don't get me wrong, I'm extremely grateful and I still love that character, you know, and, uh, you know, you get a few characters in your life, if you're lucky, where the confluence of the writing and whatever you are just kind of bang up against each other in this magical way and, you know, you're great. You're 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 lucky if you get that. So that's definitely one of those situations for me. Um, I, somebody sent me once. Um, there was people doing uh, scene work where they called scenes from a serious man, and they had scenes between uh, uh, Larry and Cy Abelman acted by other, you know, uh, very different people from me and Michael Stuhlbarg. It's interesting to see other people do those scenes. I've seen black Siobelmans, I've seen Siobelmans, I've seen women Siobelmans, I've seen all kinds of interesting, different, you know, uh, Siobelmans. Um, yeah, I, 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 
still love that movie and I still love that character. Um, occasionally, uh, you know, people, I'm familiar enough as a face that people recognize me, you know, in the street, but very often they don't know my name. They feel like, Saibuman, you know, or something <laughs> like that. I think a lot of that goes back to what you said before about how certain performances and certain art and media just really sticks with you. And I think in that case, that character and that film just stuck with a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think I think he's a character who um, he's a big enough character in terms of the impression that he leaves that he he kind of I don't want to say he transcends the film, but he he's interesting yeah. in and of himself. I think um, he is to me anyway. Um, you know, it's funny. I I he's not that different, even though he's 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 an extreme character. He's actually not so different from a lot of people that I knew growing up. There was a lot of people whose whole, even in my family, whose whole thing was like, "Don't worry, sweetheart. Like we'll we'll take care. Of you. <laughs> well, don't worry. We'll decide for you." You know. So may, maybe they weren't quite as unctuous as he was about it, but there was definitely like, uh, uh, "Do you let us decide? You know, we know what's best." There was a lot of that. So that was familiar. And also, I had an uncle. I had this uncle. My uncle Jerry, who was very, my father and my uh, my, my father um, was an interesting guy. He was a television producer, and he he came from a, quite a poor background. He was very poor growing up. He was he 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 was born in 1914. He would be 106 if he were alive today. He's he died in in 2005 when he was 90 91 or something, but he was a very uh, even though he was, he came from a very rough background. He was a Sephardic Jew who grew up in Harlem. Um, you know, a street tough kid, went, you know, got in trouble and all that. But he had this kind of softness. He was a very, there was a very soft, um, gentle quality to him. And his brother, who was my uncle, had, had it even more than my father did. And I remember my, he could say the most, he could say the most aggressive things, but he'd say them with this kind of pain look on his face where you, you felt bad for him. So I tried to sort of put that into Cy Abelman, you know, this super concerned face that he would always make. So, the, you know, you call little bits from everywhere. But um, he, he, even though he's so extreme, he wasn't, he, he was, he was a, somewhat familiar figure to me, you know, he, you know, be, be as, as, as crazy as he was. And, you know, he, he, there's another example of a person who um, is extreme in his, his Machiavellian, you know, villainy, and yet he thinks he's, he, he believes his own bullshit, and he really believes it. Now, I have a question for you guys on that score. I'm curious about something. Now, I know this is a long answer, but I'm curious to what, as to what you think the greatest problems engendered by social media are and the greatest advantages? I know it's a lot, it's a big question, but I, I, how would you distill that question? I think the greatest problems are that you can just be an anonymous face behind a computer and you could just get away with saying anything. I think that leads up to a very toxic and almost like cowardly possibility for the future. But I think an advantage is like, honestly, just finding more like-minded people. Like I've been a huge film guy my whole life and I've found a lot of movies I never would have found without social media or people recommending it on there. So I think for a way of uh, an output of art, I think is the biggest advantage. Yeah, I think when it comes to social media, I mean, I have to agree with the big advantage is the extra connection that you get with people the ability to stay in contact with, you know, people who move on with their lives, you know, people who move away, people who you maybe have not connected with in a long time. And it gives us that advantage. But at the same time, and as someone who does use Twitter a pretty decent amount, I think a big negative of it really does. And even, you know, not just talking like politically, but it allows you to get wrapped up in your own head to the point where you can become radicalized by a lot of stuff. And I think that's what you're kind of seeing a little bit. Like it almost is like you're shouting into the void and you can't, 
radical you can't have a conversation like a one-on-one with a person like in human form like face to face instead you're kind of just talking through the phone and you're just assuming the worst which is what i think is happening with a lot of people you know a lot of arguments you see online just devolve into such a toxic mess and it's 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 unbelievable yeah i really think hey i love twitter and i love the memes but i I don't think it was for the better. Honestly, I think it's made a lot of stuff worse. Well, you know, I, one of the things about it that strikes me as so unfortunate is that it gives everybody a megaphone and people have lost the ability to discriminate or perhaps the desire to discriminate between who is worth listening to, meaning who is whose intelligence or facts have been vetted. People, people believe that everything is just an opinion. Everything is just a point of view. You know, that the New York Times is no more trustworthy than say, I don't know, you know, so, you know uh, some kind of, you know, rag thing that some guy sits in his basement doing that, you know, they, it's, it's everybody has the right to say something and therefore all opinions are valid that there's no such thing as an informed opinion. That, that really is troubling to me. Um, but I feel the same thing that you do, which is that as an instrument for education or finding out things, um, you know, it's great. And you do get to hang out with people that you otherwise wouldn't. I mean, I live in LA now, but mo- mo- most of my friends still are back East and guys I went to college with, people that I miss, you know, all that. So that aspect of it's really nice, but it does, tend to reinforce this thing of you living within your own your own uh, sort of bubble of people that are your, of your shared worldview, you know, and you, it's easy to get reinforced in that worldview because few people, it, it, the, 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 the disagreements with it have become so extreme that there's kind of no tolerance for slight variation even, you know, and you get reinforced in your particular group. And that's, it's, it's shocking to me, having grown up without computers and without social, uh, without all this kind of stuff, um, how, what bellicose, you know, kind of civil war rage there is going on, which is, for, to me, has never existed within my lifetime before. I mean, until, until social media, hmm. how people are so convinced of whatever they're convinced of, that they're not even willing to entertain the possibility of there being some degree of truth to opposing points of view. It, it, it says it's kind of like dukes up, you know, all the time uh, posture instead of, you know, some degree of openness about things. So uh, that's my take on that. But it's, you know, the, well, the funny thing about it is there's no going back. It's like computers in general. You know, people complain about computers and how they've made everybody alienated from one another and we don't socialize. Nobody's going back. <laughs> nobody's going back to living without them. And nobody wants to, you know. When I was a kid, getting a car was a huge deal. When you could finally, when you're old enough to get your driver's license or even your learner's permit, it was the key to freedom because you couldn't socialize at home, you know. You'd have to be, you didn't want to be under your parents' gaze all the time you know to have any kind of social life to see to to get to get get together with people where you'd have potential boyfriends girlfriends whatever you know all the stuff that you do when you're when you're an adolescent for the first time you couldn't do that in your own house now my kids are like i'm like you know saying like well aren't you gonna don't you want to get a driver's license i promised you i'd get you a car when you're ready to go to college I'll get there. I'll get to it. It's like no big deal. We couldn't wait, could not wait to get out of the house and to learn how to drive. Um, people are so accustomed to do, sitting in their room, being on their phone or their whatever, their computer or their Xbox, whatever, that um, getting together socially is like, well, it's okay, but it's not all that necessary like it was for me when I was a young guy, you know? And that's a big change in the world. Big change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think also quarantine has uh, helped and hurt that a little bit because with some people I know they're like, oh, I'm fine the way things are going right now. Like limited like social yeah. interactions and then other people <laughs> yes. like, I want to see my friends. 
Yeah, that's what I was telling you. I started social distancing in about 1986, so it doesn't feel that weird to me. Uh, no, no, I, I know exactly what you're saying. So where in the world are you both? Buffalo. So we're, yep, Buffalo, New York. Ah, I know it well. Yep. My first girlfriend was from Rochester, so it was a long trip up to Rochester, but I, she, and so I used to go visit her there, and I, I know the area well. You, are you having, now, it must you you have lake effect snows and all that. Oh, it must be God. it must I mean this year must be really rough. <laughs> oh, this is a tough year. Get me started. <laughs> it's been today I woke up, I went outside, I was like, oh I can't even do this today. <laughs> How is it in LA? It's pretty nice. Well, I mean it's it's uh LA is very pleasant to live in about six or seven months out of the year. Then it gets very hot. It's too hot for me. I don't, I'm not good in heat. I never have been good in heat. Of course, New York gets hot too, but LA, it's, it, the summer goes, the, the warm, you got five really warm months in LA. The rest of the year is very pleasant in LA, weather-wise. Um, there are other aspects about LA that are, you know, you probably know about them. Um, there's two things in LA. There's only two things that matter. A is how sexually hot are you? And B is what are you working on? And nobody even pretends that anything. It's funny, like people may be equally shallow in other parts of the world, but for form's sake, you're supposed to kind of be interested in other things, you know, or at least appear to be. Here, it's like, well, of course, what else would be you interested in? Then, you know, what are you working on? How much money do you have? And are you hot? That's it. So once you are resigned to that fact, you know, once you see that that's how it all works, um, it's not bad at all. Um, COVID is been, has been a big nightmare here. Um, we did well at the beginning because we had a very early lockdown and people, people sort of obeyed it and it was good at the beginning, but people tired of it quickly and nobody was working. So every, and this is, this is a primarily showbiz driven place as big as it is. You know, even if you're not in showbiz, you're like the dentist of somebody who's in showbiz or the accountant of somebody who's in showbiz. And showbiz kind of ground to a halt because of COVID. And they keep trying to get it back going again, but they keep having to shut it down. Uh, and we have not had, I mean, it's, I know this is true all over the country, but we'd have a particularly bad time with the uh, vaccinations. They were all scheduled and there's not enough. I've had one and I'm supposed to have my second uh, in like two weeks, but I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that it's, available then they've not been available for a while um so uh and it you know i everybody i know has been affected pretty severely by the lockdown uh including me um you know psychologically financially a lot of i'm, I'm lucky in that i you know i've i can go for a while without working and i'm fine but a lot of people aren't in that position so it's been rough for a lot of people and it's tough on everybody emotionally you know, nobody is used to spending all their time in the house, not seeing anybody else or very few people. So it's been hard for all. Um, and, you know, the more I read about it, it seems like um, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it's not going to be the way it was for maybe quite a long time. You know, uh, movie theaters and sporting events and things like that and other things that we took for granted for, you know, most of my life, my entire life. Uh, it's a different world. So, you know, people, I, 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 I'm not concerned. People are always going to want to have movies and stuff. You know, that, that I know is, I, I don't think it's going to be any diminished need, but it's harder to work. You know, you can't, on a set, they keep, the unions keep trying to make rules to make, to make it safer. But the problem is you work very intimately with a lot of people and, you know, all the crewmen go home. They have families, they have kids, they have wives, and you're, it's very hard to not be exposed um, because everybody has a life and, you're, and, then you, and then you're getting together with them every day. So it's been, you know, very challenging. Are you in school? Are you between school or what are you? Yeah, we both uh, just graduated actually last spring from mm -hmm. Fredonia, SUNY mm -hmm. Fredonia. Yeah, that was pretty nice. I mean, I feel bad for a lot of the kids personally, me, you know, for this semester last semester i mean me and him we kind of got lucky because we only got like half a semester and then we were all done we didn't really have to deal with this too much when it came to college but yeah and that's why you're in grad school or not 
I uh, wanted to, but I didn't want to risk COVID. Like, yeah, uh, honestly, same virtual. here. It's definitely something in the back of my mind that I definitely want to go for at some point. But yeah, I I kind of just wanted to hang out for just a little bit while longer before it gets a little safer. I completely understand. I'm thrilled that my son, uh, you know, decided to, uh, you know, take a year off, uh, you know, and, and it's been great having him around. I'm enjoying him so much and everything. And it's pretty, it's still pretty wiggy out there as far as, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we'll yeah. see what happens by the fall. I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of um, encouraging things, but we'll see. We'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. I do think, I mean, I hope, I mean, I, I've been wrong about everything with COVID ever since March, 2020, but what do you mean you've been wrong. You said this will be over in a week. Yep. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> I thought this was going to be over Easter 2020. <laughs> Well, do you oh, know God, Dr. Drew, weird. Drew Pinsky? Yeah. You know Dr. Drew? Yeah. He's a friend of mine. Oh, really? And it, yeah. And he was so, yeah, he was, so, I, David Allen Greer and I uh, went to drama school together. We're good friends and we've known each other for Christ 45 years. So, and he's friends with Drew. So he introduced me to Drew. So, uh, but he was, you know, he did go on record as saying some stupid fucking thing. Like, you know, this will, don't worry, this is the flu and it won't make any, and he was, you know, he's, t t he, he got really, you know, like dragged through the ringer because of it and he's you know, having to sort of apologize every day for it now oh, God. but um you know I, look it's easy to think that uh it's easy to you know think that things were blown out of proportion a lot of things are but this was yeah no, this some, was some, pretty scary stuff yeah, definitely and and yeah. nobody alive remembers anything like it yeah you know my dad when my, my dad is not alive but when he, he when he was like five years old was when the <laughs> last time this happened 1918 yeah Some, something similar to this. but in that one uh 50 million people die mm -hmm. total so far we've had two and a half million people die all over the world not in america but all over the world but one in five of them has been in america in advanced america you wouldn't think that we would have one in five people dead from that yeah. anyway god willing we'll be yeah, with this yeah. hopefully soon yeah. so do you do you want to make movies is that what your interest is yep yeah honestly both of us are both really into film we're just aspiring to get into it i am aspiring to act personally i'm aspiring I, to write yep well um i i they're great they're as you know um they're tough they're tough fields um, I'll tell you how they work. And so you'll know. This is particularly true about acting, but to some extent for writing also. It's like surfing. <laughs> it's like surfing. I heard this said originally by who? I can't remember who, who I heard it from. Maybe Stephen Bochco? I can't remember. It's like surfing. You go out there and you sit on your board and you wait and you're waiting for a good wave and then a beautiful wave comes along and you don't catch it. Somebody else catches it and you see them ride it in and everybody goes, yay, and you missed it. And then you wait long enough and you get a wave and it's a good wave and you ride it and it's great and it's fantastic. And people are going, yay, that's great. And then of course, ultimately, you know, it hits the beach like all waves do. And then you got to turn back around <laughs> and go back out there and paddle again and then sit there and wait for another wave so you got to have the you got to be ready in your mind to know that even for really successful people that's how it works it's you you got to be ready for those times those fallow times and times when you're waiting and all that stuff the good things about it are great but the hard things about it are very hard and i say this as a person who's had unusual success so, but it's, 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 it, when it, when it, when it goes good, it's great. It's, 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 there's nothing more enjoyable and, you know, you get to do something that you really love. And if you're lucky, you make good money at it too. And it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And it's always new because there's new stories, new people, new everything. So it never gets tiring, at least to me, but it's set up to keep people out. Show business is set up to keep people out and you have to be, you have to work at being good as Steve Martin said, you have to be so good that they cannot ignore you. 
You know, everybody, everybody thinks like, well, what's the secret that, you know, like, how do I get the best headshot or how do I get a good agent or how do I get to the right party where I can meet the right. And uh, it's, you got to just work at it and, you know, and, 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 uh, and not lose your, your mojo for it. You know, you got to stay, stay, you know, keep your eyes on what you want. But I wish you well in the in the process, and I'd be anxious to hear how, like, what you're, what you're, what you're, how it's going, and what you, what you're thinking. You know, like, if you want to go to school more, or you want to just try and do it, and all that. Thank you. Oh, thank you thank so you. much. That means yeah. a lot. Honestly, yeah, I can't even tell you how much that means to me. Happy to happy to say it. I mean, you're obviously into it. You're obviously, you know, film fans, and uh, there's always room. It's it's hard, but there's always room for people that are good always room for people that are good. And if anybody discourages you, don't listen. Don't listen. <laughs> you have to know that you have the thing in you to do it. That's all. That's all. It's, you know, it's, it's discouraging sometimes. It's hard. But then you get it and it's great. That's, that doesn't sound all that wise, but, but that's, no, that's, oh, that's no, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we got all of our questions. You know. uh, I just have one more thing. One more. Sure. Um, this is really dumb, but I wanted to show you this. And I oh. wanted to see your reaction. Yeah. The meme. It's a meme. It's a, it's a, I need to show you a Cy Abelman since, since we got an interview. Oh, okay, sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works. Makes sense. <laughs> All right. Austin, send me that I would, today. Yeah, Crack I would watch up. that. Yeah. I'm a Joe Pesci fanatic. I, I am down for a recast yeah. <laughs> i love joe pesci too but you know he hardly I works anymore that. he had to like have his arm twisted to do uh the irishman he didn't want to do it he's so rich now he doesn't want to, i don't blame one, him one of my favorite things is that. uh his oscar acceptance speech oh yeah yeah thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> he just walks off <laughs> i don't know why that like cracks me up so much <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I loved him. And, you know, he, for years and years, he wasn't an actor. He, he uh, played guitar in a duo with the guy who played Billy Bats, who died. The guy, uh, I can't think of his name at the moment, but the guy, you know, the guy who played Billy Bats in, in uh, Goodfellas, mm -hmm. the guy that they kill. Oh, yeah, Shine yeah, Box. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't think. I can't think of his real name. Yeah, I can't think of his He name. was in a duo where they played in an Italian restaurant. They both played guitar and sang. For like you know like three hundred dollars a week, really, uh, uh, for many many years, and then they and then they got back into acting, but I didn't know about him at all. I don't think anybody knew about him uh, until uh, Raging Bull, mm -hmm. you know, when Raging Bull came out, which was, I don't know, probably mid eighties, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. To, now, so, what do you do with this? Do you edit it, and or what do you? Is it or I'm going to edit it? it and then uh, uh, put it on my website as well as YouTube, and I will send you a link to the website as soon as it's finished. All right. Great. Great. Awesome. I look forward to it. Awesome. Well, thank you so thank much you for so talking much. to us. Yeah. It's my this pleasure. I really enjoyed it, and and uh, it's great to talk to you. And uh, you know, let me know how things are going, and. Uh, you know, when, when this, when this God willing, when this thing ends, if you ever decide you want to come to LA, uh, let me know by all yeah. means. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank Especially you so much. Now. Oh, I mean, I'd be yeah. from LA right uh, now. <laughs> I'm going to go shovel my car off. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, have a good rest of the, 